Hi everyone, thanks for joining the webinar. We're going to get started in just about one minute. All right, everyone, welcome to our webinar, Turning Your Haters into Fans, How Miami-Dade Parks and Rec Uses Social Media to Listen to Residents and Improve Its Reputation. So before we get started, I just want to go through a few housekeeping slides. Um, everyone should be on mute. However, feel free to use the question function to submit your questions. And to find where that is, you'll see you have a control panel for GoToWebinar. And over on the right, you'll see a panel for questions. So you can just type your questions in there and you can select them to either go to the group or just to the speakers. And feel free to put your questions in at any time. There will be time for Q&A at the end. And go ahead and put those questions in the chat window. And finally, the webinar is being recorded and you will receive a link to the recording um, via email afterwards. Okay, so here's today's agenda. We're really excited about today's webinar. We have Yasini Kameho joining us from Miami-Dade Parks and Rec, and she's going to be talking about turning haters into fans for about 30 minutes. Then we're going to have our second speaker, Anil Chavala, talking about three options for responding to records requests. And then lastly, we're going to have a live Q&A with both Yasini and Anil to address all audience questions. So I'd just like to tell you a little bit about our speaker, Yaseni. She is the Sales and Marketing Manager at Miami-Dade Parks and Rec, and she's been with the county for six years. She also runs her own freelance marketing business, which she's done for the past 16 years, um, has a BFA in photography from FIU, and she's really responsible for all the social media um, accounts and content creation with the agency. And I just want to say that I really enjoyed working with her and preparing for this webinar. She's got a really innovative strategy for dealing with controversy on social media. And she's had a really fun journey from the beginning to where she is now. So it's been fun for me to follow along with her approach. And I think um, everybody is going to get a lot of it. So with that being said, Yaseni, thanks so much for being here. And I will hand it over to you. And we can go ahead and get started. Hi. Just a second while I switch it over to you. Okay. Okay. Great. All right. There you go. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm so excited to have all of you here logged on with me today. It's been so much fun. Like Stephanie said, thank you so much for the great introduction. So like she said, we're going to be speaking about how to turn your haters into fans um, and successfully how we transformed our reputation. Um, where is Miami-Dade County? Well, we're in southern Florida. We're at the tip of the panhandle. Um, and we're the third largest um, parks department in the uh, nation. So we have 2.8 million residents and 1.8 of them reside in unincorporated portions of Miami-Dade and we have 35 municipalities. So we have quite a bit. Um, when she asked me, you know, like, what do you guys do? How many parks do you have? Well, we have a lot going on. So 
We um, also have to publish a lot of things in both uh, English, Spanish, and Creole because we have a very uh, populous area. Um, and so, like I said, we have 270 parks, um, six golf courses, six, 14 miles of beaches, six marinas, uh, several campgrounds, lots of pools, as you can imagine. And um, among other beautiful gems that we have in our system. So, like I said, we're the third largest park system in the U.S. We're behind um, Chicago's Park District and New York, of course, the big city. Um, so our modest uh, park system of 270 parks. So our social following is modest, but we have a lot of accounts. This is our parks um, page only. We have 34 accounts. So Archive Social loves us because we have a lot of archiving going on. Um, they span between the di different divisions, which is Daring Estate, Great Spice, um, golf, eco adventures. So we manage quite a bit of pages on uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Nextdoor. Um, our YouTube channel, we have, you know, a, a YouTube channel, we have 116 Google business pages and uh, about 109 Yelp business pages. So we manage quite a bit of social media um, and messaging all the time. Um, just a little bit about me. Like she said, I'm a marketing professional of 16 years. I was in private sector before coming to um, the public sector world, which has been quite a journey, uh, learning a lot about, you know, county government and how that works. Um, I moved to Miami-Dade County about six years ago um, to, to work in the public sector. So I've been working on everything from, you know, special projects to digital marketing to social media. And um, so I'm so excited to be here. Um, so we're going to talk about the problems that exist when we in ignore residents. Um, today, you know, if you don't answer people, they will find you. And our resident sentiments, uh, examples of our marina traffic, which gives us specific examples, and seaweed. So, and a little bit of tips and more. So, let's get into it. So, ignore them and they will find you. I know you guys, if you have children, you'll know that if you try to get a quiet spot to go run to and close the door, your kids will find you. Well, it's the same thing for your residents. If you try to, you know, put a blind eye to something, it's not, it's not going to go away. It's going to come back. And because they live there and they enjoy where they live and they want to continue to enjoy where they live. So even though this is funny and I tried to show some PG examples, by the way. Um, ignoring your residents. Why is it a bad idea? Well, it infuriates them. So imagine your children too, like they will try to get your attention no matter what to get their needs met. Well, it's the same thing. It infuriates, it frustrates them. They're relentless um, and they become confused because you're not answering what their questions are. Um, I, you know, I, I showed some examples you know, we had a, a someone who was high profile that kind of posted something about our inadequate places, and um, we came back with a witty response, hoping you know that it was suffice and it did. It kind of um, changed the point of view. So today we're working in a very different environment where if you ignore people, they get really, really, really irate, um, and that's why we're we're going to point to some specific examples where we've addressed something that's been ongoing and how we changed it, our reputation. So here's here's some of the other community sentiments. You know, people are very concerned with their safety and they're concerned with their parks and what their what the parks are like. Um, and and we we try to address every single one of these complaints. There's more community sentiments. Um, and and when you when you don't respond to these types of community uh, responses, residents will find a way to express themselves. So they will take sh cheap shots at you. They will 
get other people behind them. Um, and then they sometimes don't understand the impediments behind resolving an issue. So if, if you say to them, okay, quite literally, we don't have funding for this, they sometimes back down and say, oh, okay, I get it. So we have really creative people who they love to complain and, you know, everybody gets Everybody gets people who love to complain. So what are our areas of concern? We took all of our complaints and we said, oh, let's look and see. Where are our areas of concern? Like how high on you know the, the posting schedule do we do we get a lot of these? Well we do. We get I put them in alphabetic order, but I would say that our top complaint is probably trash and safety. Um, the other ones fall just below that, probably dogs and yet seaweed. Um, we get lots of seaweed complaints. Well, we used to, um, and, I'll, and I'll show you why. So closures is a big deal, and alligators and crocs. Yes, people, we have a lot of those down here in South Florida. Um, they don't bother people as long as you don't bother them. But yes, we do have them. Um, so we we have examples. One of these that I'm going to point out to you, the one I have in front of you, is thank you for posting your concerns. Uh, the dog park is closed on the fourth Monday of every spring. Well, it's because residents were not seeing the signs that we were posting monthly, and they were complaining that Amelia Earhart's bark park was closed. Well, it was closed because. They don't, we don't want their dogs to get fleas and ticks, so we would spray every so often and close the park. So now this resident was complaining, and now she knows for future uh, springs that it's the fourth Monday of every month. And now we post, you know, periodically we have the manager post signs so that they have that ability to know when their park park, park is closed. Um, but as you can see, a lot of dog park concerns throughout our system. Um, Another, like I said, a big concern is crocs, um, but educating our public about crocs and alligators is one of the biggest things that we we do. So our big um, example is our examples on um, traffic and the proactive messaging that we do behind that. So one of the biggest um, things that we found, and especially through looking through our archive of messaging, was that during holidays, during special events, we had a lot of boat traffic in our six marinas. Our six marinas uh, provide an immense amount of people access to the water. A lot of people trailer their boats into the marinas instead of having slips there. Um, all, you know, a lot of it them do it because it's cost prohibitive to you know to um, have your boat um, in a slip um, even though you know we have really really great rates but private marinas are much more expensive than our public marinas. Our public marinas um, allow people to have their boats and slips but people still choose to bring their boats and trailers so we have a lot of boat traffic during this time frame so we are getting series of complaints prior to probably 2015. Um, once we started instilling messages on our social media, we started seeing those complaints drop dramatically. We had partners and, as you can see here, other areas of our county system help us with um, that information. And time over time, it's proven that the more we preventatively or proactively message out about these times, that the less complaints we get on the back end of our um, on the back end of the holiday. So when we come back from holiday, we're actually rested. Yeah. We are actually not coming back to a series of why was the boating marina so packed um, with cars and trailers. Um, we do want residents to know ahead of time. So what we do is we post a press release. The press release goes out. And then we post it all over social media and we give everybody the ample opportunity to know that our six marinas which are full service um, and, and you can have wet slips for that you know, overnight period if you want for that uh, weekend is available. And that kind of gives everybody like the proactive approach versus 
later on having people seriously complain to us about, oh my God, I couldn't, I couldn't get into the marine now. So super easy. We just get ahead of it and put out the messaging and call it a day. Another example that we saw was kind of one of those things that were like, are you seriously complaining about seaweed? And yes. Um, so people did find it, I guess, we, we saw Floridians, you know, deal with it. You know, we, we know that there's like a period where it comes and it goes, but I guess people who are not from the area come and they see the seaweed and they think, oh, this is gross. They didn't clean it up or whatnot. But we were, we were taking proactive efforts to clean it up. However, it comes back. And so, um, there is kind of like this new approach to, um, us getting the word out that yes, we do have a lot of seaweed and sometimes it accumulates a little faster than we can pick it up or if we pick it up it comes back so it just it just that's just the way it happens but there is a very 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 good explanation for all of this and the reason why we need seaweed um so the, we do have some really really pristine beautiful beaches and Crandon is one of them and we don't um we don't understand why sometimes they're like oh it's, it's a terrible beach well no it's not it's it's seasonal it happens every so often um and these are some examples of some of the messaging that we were getting that was making us think oh no we have to do something about this so we we asked our experts and they came up with some messaging for us some of it's very technical so this was kind of some of the messaging that we put out um but then we made it consumable. And so we started putting messaging out regarding seaweed, you know, why it's, it's, it's beneficial to our habitat, you know, marine life needs it, especially our beautiful turtles. We have tons of sea turtles and especially during sea turtle season, um, we, we, we have very big uh, restrictions on how we clean the beaches, when we clean the beaches and um, in what fashion it's done. So we, we replied to every single concern um, and we posted about the benefits of seaweed, yummy seaweed, <laughs> and we looked into providing additional resources to help clean the beaches. And in fact, we have a lot of volunteers that come and help clean trash off the beaches, let alone help us, you know, with the seaweed. So we took a completely different approach to this and everyone's kind of, you know, pitched in also in the messaging from our partners and our other um, resources in the county. So one of the other things that I didn't put as a prime example, but um, in the summer, it rains a lot here in South Florida. Um, and we get a lot of um, delayed efforts to cut our grass. So we saw a lot of people that were complaining that our grass was too high and whatnot. So we started putting proactive messaging out there about that. And that has proven to help um retard that effort you know like complaints about oh my gosh so and so you know is not cutting the grass and whatnot so so now that moves me to tips on how you guys can um really get your reputation in check and focus on what really matters so really truly listening to your uh, residents concerns if you have a question look through the emotion don't don't pay attention to the to the emotion behind it. Acknowledge it. Make sure you empathize with them. Say, you know, we totally understand how you feel. However, here is, you know, here is the fact. The facts are, you know, it rains, you know, uh, every day in, in the summer. And, you know, sometimes our rain does delay our cutting of cycles. Our next cycle will be X, Y, Z. Um, listen to their concerns. Don't ignore them. They'll find you. They'll they'll call you. They'll text you. They'll send an airplane ad if they have to. Um, but they will they want you to listen. The next is provide proactive messaging and find trends within your um, complaints so you can provide proactive messaging during the right time frame. We did that during the seaweed. We did that during our marine um, traffic flow. We do it during cut cycles. 
Um, there's numerous times we do it. In our golf division, they, they do it when the um, pass cart is only available, um, multiple areas. Um, take responsibility and offer to speak to a person on the phone. People want to hear your voice. They want to know there's a person on the other side of the line. They're not just a computer that a screen and text and copy in font 2.5. Uh, you know, they, they don't they don't want to know that that you're hiding behind something and take responsibility. It it is your your responsibility to take care of whatever property it is to take care of. If you're sorry, here's how you move forward. And then be authentic. Um, speak as, as a voice. You're the voice of the organization. You know, be be a human and and tell them exactly what it is that you would like to hear. Obviously factual. Um, so that those are my tips for for you guys and some of the results were that we stopped getting negative political impacts to our leaders um complete started becoming minimal to our commissioner's office we were doing such a good job commissioners were dealing with other things other than complaints about what you know our park system uh issues were the well you know it builds trust and then two-way communication I mean, that's a double-edged sword with the two-way communication because now people know that we're responding to our messages, so they're responding. Uh, they're asking more questions, but they're positive questions. They're not complaints. They're, hey, when do you have this program available? And we respond. Um, and, oh, I really like this. And it's positive experience. You know, I had a meaningful experience. Here, here's, here's a picture from my experience instead of you guys are terrible and we don't like you. Um, so, We've complied with our public records request and social media archiving has helped us to comply with our state laws. Our state laws require us to keep our records for seven years. And that's pretty much how I was able to do my presentation. I went back and pulled data from many, many years. And that's how you guys are able to see a lot of these examples. So I hope you guys enjoyed my presentation. And um, if you'd like to contact me, you can contact me at my email or uh, follow me on Twitter. And if you have any other questions, um, we'll answer it during the question and answer center sent, um, session. Um, Stephanie, back to you. Thank you so much, Cindy. That was great. And I really appreciated just getting that sort of behind the scenes look at, you know, how you come up with your strategy. Um, love the seaweed example. It's just so funny that people are wanting you to clean up the seaweed <laughs> and I love what you did <laughs> with translating the kind of official information that you got into um, you know something social media appropriate so I'm excited for everybody to be able to ask you questions I know there's going to be a lot of them so if you've got questions go ahead and put them in right now and we're going to wrap them up for later but before we do that I just want to turn to our next speaker Neil Chavla he's the founder and CEO of Archive Social and He's actually a national speaker and subject matter expert on issues related to legal policy and records management related to social media and government. Um, he's spoken at a lot of conferences nationally, including 3CMA, NAGW, and recently GSMCon. I think some of you might have been there. Um, and just a little bit about Archive Social. If you haven't been to a webinar before, or you're not familiar with us, we're the number one provider of social media archiving and government, protect more than 2,000 public agencies around the country. and customers from large cities like New York City and Chicago to the smallest towns in 40 plus states. So Anil, thanks for being here. Well, thank you, Stephanie, for the introduction and thank you all for joining us. Uh, and of course, thank you, Yaseni, for, for taking the time to tell your story. Uh, while uh, most of us have 14 miles less beach than you do, <laughs> there's a lot that we can relate to in what you shared. And particularly, I think, from a customer service standpoint, we all get that as individuals and, and citizens ourselves that customer service is game changing and with public agencies and government in general, uh, we exist to, to serve, inform and protect the public. That customer service is so important. Uh, I really appreciated your, 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 um, you know, philosophy on, on being proactive. And I thought what was most, most exciting about what you talked about was that most of the, the things that come up are the day to day type items that, that happen in your city or county or your region. Oftentimes our attention goes to the, the crisis events or the viral situations, the big headlines, but it's really the day-to-day -day stuff that matters the most. And, and the fact that 
you, Yaseni, and, and your and your and your peers are are so responsive and proactive it goes a long way towards that positive social media presence. Uh, makes a big difference. So so acknowledging acknowledging that the day to day uh, of what we do in government matters, um, and it may even come off as mundane, but it's so important that day to day. Uh, really is a reflection of, of, of the function of government, the function of social media today as a primary communications mechanism. Again, not only for the really special, exciting circumstances, but with what's happening day in and day out. Something that important uh, also has some important considerations. So I appreciate, as you mentioned, you're sending up the, the archiving uh, requirements, uh, really the requirements around public records and archiving being a means to, to ensure your compliance. And so what I want to do is take a step back here and talk about that other side of the coin. When you when you have something that's so important, informing your informing the public, engaging with them, responding to them, being proactive, social media being the mechanism to do that, um, something that important then has important considerations, particularly in government around legal and policy. So for those of you who are managing your social media, you're in the communications office, you're a public information officer, or maybe you're behind the scenes uh, in some ways supporting the, the use of social media, Public records are, are a critical foundational concern um, for, for a communications channel like social media. And so I wanted to take some time, just about 10 and 15 minutes here, to go through some of the background on, on this issue for those of you who are less familiar with it, but also for those of you who are familiar with it, give you an update on what we're seeing in the legal space, uh, provide some guidance on how to respond to records requests. There are different ways to do it. Again, Archive Social and Full Disclosure provides archiving software. But I want to step back out of that and give you some general guidance, three different ways that you might approach this issue of having the records. Uh, and my goal here is to, for those of you who are, who are continuing to expand your social media presence, be as engaging and interactive as, as your Sunday's team is able to, that you have the appropriate protection in place, particularly from a record standpoint. I'll give you at least one action item coming out of this, out of this presentation. So with that, uh, I'm going to briefly touch on public records. Again, this is an, an issue that uh, is, is, is very well established now in our space. Um, wasn't wasn't quite as established maybe five six years ago where there were a lot of questions about whether or not social media is public record and and what you need to do about it. Today it's well accepted across the country. Um, most states in the country uh, not only have a sunshine type law, a Freedom of Information Act, a, a Public Records Act, a Public Records Law like Florida uh, that 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 indicates that that communication regardless of physical form is record. On top of that, most states also now have clear guidance on social media as a record, applying that public existing public records law from, from the 70s to today's communications, clear guidance explaining when and how social media becomes a record of value, uh, and clear guidance on your responsibilities in the agency to take control of that information, you know, because you cannot rely on the social networks to do that for you. So that guidance is out there. Well, I wanted to point everybody on the line um, to the guidance for your state. So um, if you'd like to, to learn more about what the latest guidance is from your official state uh, authority. Uh, you can go to this bit.ly, bit.ly slash SM Public Records, click on your state, and uh, we at Archive Social continue to compile and update the latest and greatest from your state authorities in regards to the official legal, legal guidance there. All right. And so let me jump into some case law uh, to really to, to bring this to reality in terms of how uh, record keeping uh, plays a vital role in protecting your agency uh, and your ability to communicate across social media. And when it comes to having haters, controversy, or just folks that are upset, which is all normal in government, um, that, of course, is exploding across social media uh, pages in government. Um, and sometimes it's quiet and sometimes it's loud. In certain areas, you, you may never have had an issue until you have one. Um, the record keeping becomes fundamentally important, particularly when it comes to First Amendment concerns. So you all probably have seen this in the news across the board for the last few years. Um, particularly related to public officials, uh, from the president to governors to, to, to local council, men and women, this, this issue comes up quite a bit because people want to be heard. Um, they are they are participating on your Facebook page, and sometimes they're happy and sometimes they're not. Um, and, and so First Amendment is such an important concern that it comes up a lot. I want to give just an example here. And this is actually from a, a few years back, uh, really talking about how this comes up not only for public officials, but it comes up in agencies of all types, um, with Elkhart, Indiana, uh, similarly, this came out with Beach Grove, Indiana, and agencies were sued for for uh, for uh, actually removing comments on Facebook, um, and due to First Amendment concerns, they were actually sued by the ACLU, um, and so th this can quickly become an important issue. And the ACLU, by the way, has not only filed these lawsuits in Indiana a few years ago, 
um, but filed a lawsuit against the governor of Maryland, which was settled uh, last year. And uh, it most recently had, had even sent a letter of complaint to an agency in Georgia. So throughout the country, again, the ACLU looking out for people's rights in regards to the First Amendment, I'm really getting behind this issue. And if you're not careful as a government agency, um, it, it can be a real problem. So you want to be careful with your policy, but you have to have the records because when there is a lawsuit that comes in related to content that's been deleted or removed, how do you tell your story without the records? You really need to have those records. So uh, keep in mind that any agency of any type, um, again, here at Elkhart, uh, Indiana, uh, again, Beach Grove was another one, an animal center page was one that was involved in this situation, particularly in Indiana. Any kind of agency, again, you all, every, every type of agency uh, communicates in an important way, can, can fall into controversy when somebody is upset. Um, con content does get removed and edited and changed all the time. There are First Amendment concerns. So you have to be able to tell your side of the story and really show that you, you have a good policy and you've, been, you've followed it. Um, again, this became a very difficult situation in Indiana at the time. Now, moving forward, I want to tell a flip side of this uh, success story with one of our customers coming out of Margate, Florida. And uh, essentially, the, the headline on this is that the agency received a public records request uh, for deleted comments. But it was quite more involved than that. And this may actually be an example that resonates with, 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 with folks on the line here. Um, and I want to highlight again that going into this type of situation, Margate, Margate had a clear social media policy. Very, very important for you to have your social media policy defined and posted publicly and they were archiving. So they had done their diligence, put the practice in place. And essentially what happened here is that a local citizen had launched a website, margatenews.net, um, which uh, for, for a third party would seem to be related to the city of Margate, but really was a private citizen's page uh, and promotional in nature, which is, which is against the city of Margate social media policy. And repeatedly was posting that content um, on the city of Margate's official page, creating a lot of confusion. Um, because it's violated the policy, the city of Margate did moderate that content, removed it. Uh, the citizen uh, recognized the content's being removed, uh, and, and, and essentially it complained, thinking, you know, this is this is Florida. There's a public records law. My content has to be up there, and also I have a First Amendment right to say what I want. Was the citizen's uh, viewpoint, um, and so the citizen was, was starting to complain, and eventually actually issued a public records request for various information. Um, off of the Facebook page. And so the, the citizen went from complaining to taking action. And again, fortunately, because the, the city archives, they're able to produce that information that was requested, including content that had been deleted, right? Again, content that they would not have been able to produce otherwise had they not been archiving. They were able to do it, uh, produce that deleted content in response to the records request. And more importantly, really demonstrate that they had, and here's an example, by the way, of a, of a deleted comment um, that they're able to produce, really demonstrate um, that they had followed their policy, had the records that they're obligated to have by Florida public records law, and really showed the city had done everything right. So while the citizen wasn't quite happy, there's really no grounds for any kind of legal action uh, from, from the citizen because the city was following their process, policies and procedures, adhering to their policy, and had the records to prove it. That's exactly the position that we, we want every agency to be in so that, again, you can continue to reap all of the benefits from social media um, as, as controversy and records requests will come up with social media just as they have with uh, other types of, of, of agency actions in the past. So with that, I want to switch gears here and talk about how, how you can think about social media retention uh, and approach it, and there are some different options. Uh, and before we get into the options, it's worth acknowledging the, the importance of this issue and the challenge of the issue. And, and perhaps the most important thing to recognize when it comes to your social media communications is while you are making those communications and while you receive them on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and other sites, you really have no control over the medium. Facebook is run by Facebook, YouTube is run by YouTube, and so on and so forth. Um, that is a private company. It's not your IT department, right? And content can show up on those pages and disappear without any of your control. Um, and that's a real challenge when it comes to public records uh, compliance, so that, such that if you were requested that information in the future, um, you have to have some means to, ha to have kept that record uh, because you can't just rely on Facebook still having it because then you don't control that platform. Um, these platforms do constantly change, change their features, uh, make policy changes and so forth, and essentially have no guarantees that they'll maintain the information in accordance with the records requirement. Big takeaway here is you cannot rely on Facebook, Twitter, and these other social networks for your legal record keeping. You have to take action. Uh, and to really put a, a, a point on that exclamation, Here's a study that we did uh, here at Archive Social. Our technology not only archives, but we can actually detect deletions across the board, across social networks. 
And so a lot of times folks would ask us, well, okay, I get it, content can be deleted or edited without my control, it could go away, I could lose it, but is that really a big problem? Uh, you know, I, I, I as a, a city staff member, I never delete, so I don't think I'm losing anything. So we decided that, you know, that's a, that's a fair point um, to, to really study this issue. We looked at 500 different government customers, monitored their pages for one month, and found over 200 and over 200,000 records deleted from their social networks across those customers. So across the 500 customers, on average, 400 records per customer lost, uh, more than 10 a day, right? Now, every customer had 10, some had one or two, but many had dozens, and several had over hundreds of records lost in a month, even, even towns of, of small size, you know, under 25,000 in population. So this, this is an issue that really uh, clearly affects agencies of all types. And if you're wondering, well, again, if, if, we're, if we as city staff do not delete, how, how does that happen? Well, remember, this is a two-sided conversation. And just as easily as citizens create content on your social media, they also can take it away, uh, edit and delete their content. And so citizens do delete and edit all the time, remove their content. Um, and frankly, something that happens a lot that we don't think about from a record standpoint, but, it, but it's critical, is that uh, citizens can, can partake on your social media, provide a lot of commentary, uh, communications of record, and then choose to quit Facebook. And when they do that, the social networks are, are, are all now designed to protect user privacy. Those records get pulled out of the social network. They get removed automatically when the user quits or closes their account. And so you could easily lose in one swoop dozens or hundreds of records from an individual without even knowing it. And that's exactly what, what really goes into this kind of number. So again, you cannot rely on the social networks for your compliance with public records law. So uh, let's let's look at look at this in a, in a more of a uh, kind of uh, organized fashion. Uh, what does that really mean? And and uh, and when it comes to your options, what can you do? You know, fundamentally, there are three options for responding to records requests. Um, you can try to rely on the social networks. Again, you cannot rely on it confidently, but perhaps some of the information is still there. Again, it's not a great uh, in any way, a solid strategy for, for public records compliance. But if you get a records request, certainly, if you have nothing else, go back to the social networks, try to try to produce it. Um, again, note that in many networks, edited content is not is not tracked. So, for example, on Instagram, an edited comment does not show you that version history. Um, you may not, uh, you certainly will not be able to produce deleted content. Um, metadata is very important from a public records standpoint. We're not going to get too deep into that unless folks have some questions, and I'd be happy to explain it more. Um, you, you're really not going to be able to pull that metadata uh, for the electronic record from the social networks page, uh, just taking a screenshot of it. Uh, the search, uh, if you've ever tried to search Facebook or a, another site, is very, very limited on the platform and, and, and doesn't instill a tremendous amount of confidence, confidence in finding what you need. So again, keep that in mind. And, and really being able to compile that information, even if you're able to find all of it, is quite a task. Um, and being able, be able to reconstruct everything back to the, the timelines and the conversations that came from very, very difficult. So again, going to the network is an option, but what you get is what you get. And, and that's really the reality of it. Again, that's why we say it's not a true option for public access compliance. It may be helpful in a particular instance and it may come through for you. Um, a better option is to take screenshots, um, either reactively or better than that, more proactively. Again, this is free record keeping from a US dollar standpoint in terms of your agency's funds. Obviously, it takes somebody's time, and time is money. Um, and I'm sure your time and your colleague's time is, is worth quite a lot. And so, uh, again, it would take time to take screenshots. Um, agencies that do it proactively spend about 20 to 30 hours a month taking screenshots. Keep in mind that this may help you keep a, a more of a record than simply relying on the social network. But uh, it is difficult to search your, your repository screenshots. Um, you will not have metadata. And it can still be challenging, ultimately, to compile that information and confidently respond to a records request. So that does take us to archiving software. And again, there are different options out there. So when you look at archiving software, here's some guidance on what to look for. Number one, you want to pay attention to the capture rate of that software. Again, this data is out of your control. So the faster you can get it in your control, the better. Uh, minimize that window of data loss. Um, be very, very careful um, with any archiving vendor or any approach that really hand waves this and says, oh, yeah, we just get everything. Well, what do you get off of Facebook? Do you get the timeline? Do you get the private messages? Do you get the albums? How you know? Do you get that in real time, near real time, um, or not? Really trying to understand that, like, really understanding that capture frequency can go a long way for when you have a records request and you're wondering, why don't I have that record? Well, it comes down to that, that pot, did that technology actually capture it for you in the first place? Again, the same thing with deletions and edits and, and hides. 
Um, you need software that can navigate these different states of, uh, of, of the communication, uh, the visibility state of this communication, whether it's still hit available publicly or not, um, and tracks that version history. So again, on a site like Instagram that doesn't actually track the version history, look for software that figures that out and does it for you. Again, the platforms are not built for record keeping, and that's what archiving software is for. Metadata, again, critical for your compliance. The search functionality, critical. And then uh, I almost skipped it right to it because I always get excited about this. It really, at the end of the day, your archive comes down to not just having the data, but really about being able to produce it when you need it. And so pay close attention to the archiving software if you start to evaluate it on, on, on how it actually works in, in a records request situation. Literally, you should put that software through a simulated records request where you have content that um, appears in various conversations across all of your different social networking sites and see how that software does in terms of bringing it all back together in a way that makes sense. I'll give you an example on that. Um, if you do a search for, for your social media content in an archive, you might find on the left side you see here a mixed bag of comments, private messages, tweets, YouTube videos, and so forth. If you had a records request as many of our customers have had from uh, an attorney or a group like the ACLU, um, or really anyone who, who really cares about that records request, and you send them this mixed bag, um, you are going to get a, you're going to set a questions back because nobody can make sense of this. There's no there's no no clear sense from this of which comment relates to which other comment, what conversation is that a part of, um, what is this, right? That's really the question you're going to get. And so whatever archiving approach you take for record keeping, make sure that you can take these dozens, hundreds, thousands, or tens of thousands of results corresponding to your records request, and it pieces it back together to the conversations that actually occurred. So for example, it may be that two different comments match your search, but those two comments belong to a longer conversation. Your approach needs to recombine that, reconstruct that full conversation, all the surrounding comments, the photos, the parent posts, all that needs to come together for anybody to be able to make sense of it, for you to be able to confidently respond to a records request. So uh, a really important thing to test in your, in your record keeping approach. Um, at the end of the day, um, when we look at these different approaches, again, you have a high risk, very high risk of noncompliance with social, with relying on the social networks, while the cost is virtually, uh, is, there's nothing, right? Screenshots give, require some time, um, and you trade off some of that risk because you have, you have a better record than simply having to go back to Facebook or Twitter. Archiving software, on the other hand, can really bring your risk down to the lowest possible extent. Nothing can eliminate risk 100%, but it can get you quite close, um, and at a cost, from a cost standpoint, uh, there is a real cost to archiving software, but a lot of folks are, are quite surprised with the fact that it often fits in discretionary spends. Um, so under 5000 annual is, is typically our price point. And again, we'd, we'd encourage you to evaluate the options out there. So in summary, social media is a must for your agency. I think we've crossed that bridge for, for, for most agencies. It is a primary channel of communication. You heard from Yaseni on how important it is for being proactive. Um, and navigating the various uh, complaints and issues that folks deal with and making sure they have a positive experience there in Miami-Dade. Agencies across the country actually are receiving records requests. We saw that with the two examples that we shared with you. We have dozens upon dozens of records request examples throughout the country, many that are probably local to you, uh, those of you who are on the phone today. So these requests are coming in for social media. You do need to be prepared to respond to them in some way. And so in order to do that, you do need to take some action, make sure you have a strategy and approach for record keeping because fundamentally it does come down to having the records both for public records compliance and for defending your agency and for reducing the amount of time and headache and cost that your agency might, might expend in the future. So take action now. On that note, I'm going to wrap up here so that we can have time for questions. But we do want to invite folks who, that are interested in learning more about archiving software and you, if you are evaluating your options or thinking about this issue, um, you know, hopefully you see it as an important issue to address if you're at, at all active on your social media. They must do to have records. Um, we at Archive Social want to be a resource to you. We'll, we'll be happy to set up a phone call with you. This phone call will not be a product pitch. Um, it is our, our first phone call is, is, is entirely designed to be a resource to you where we'll talk about the records law, uh, the legal guidance in your state, um, really help clarify that from the work that we do with uh, uh, likely dozens, if not hundreds of agencies around you. Uh, we can actually tell you about the agencies that do archive with us so you can speak with them directly and learn more about their reasons and their experiences with us. Um, and really importantly, we can give you some more guidance around the records requests and legal situations that have happened right around you, maybe your neighboring town or city or in your county. These are situations that weren't in the news, but because of the work we do with over 2,000 agencies, we've seen it all. So we do like to spend 20 or 30 minutes with you walking through the legal landscape to see 
um, where you sit. If any of this is interesting to you, we'd be happy to be a resource to you to talk to you about these issues um, and, and take the time from our end to, to get you up to speed. So I'm going to put a quick poll on the screen while, while you're uh, all, all thinking about that and, and putting your questions in. Again, if we can be a resource to you here at Archive Social on any of these points, go ahead and fill out this poll um, and we'll be sure to reach out. Um, and then while we're doing that, I'm going to hand back to Stephanie for questions. All right, great. Thanks, Anil. And as Anil said, uh, feel free to fill out that poll. It's completely optional, but um, put your answers in there. And also, we're getting a lot of questions coming in. So if you do have a question and you want to squeeze it in in this last 10 minutes we've got here with Yesenia and Anil, go ahead and put that in there. And I'm just going to go ahead and start rolling out these questions, you two. So first question for Yesenia. Uh, Isani, this question is about the size of your social media team, and can you just tell us a little bit about, you know, how big it is, how many people are on it, and how it works? Sure. Thank you, Stephanie, and thanks for the question. That's actually a really good question. We're actually a team of a communicators that are seven in the internal communications for uh, Miami-Dade Parks. And then there's another seven that handle social media for the divisions. So they act as kind of the liaisons for the specific divisions like um, eco-adventures or golf or criteria like steering. So since we have 34 accounts, they handle some of those other accounts. For our Miami-Dade Park page, which is the kind of um, general head page, um, between like four or five of us, we handle it here. So, okay, great. Kind of a long answer. Another for... question we have. Yeah, no, that's fine. It's, I think a lot of people are sort of one man teams or they've got larger yeah. teams and everybody's always curious about what everybody else's team looks like. Yeah. So another <laughs> question, this is a good one. Um, we had is, was there any pushback from anyone at your agency about this this style that you've adopted um, with responding to people with negative comments? For example, did you ever consider just hiding them or ignoring them and not responding at all? Actually, that's a really, really, really good question because when I did approach our operations team to cooperate with us to help with answering these questions, the operations director looked at me and he was like, what? We have to answer every single one? And I said, yes, every single one. And and they were like, we can't do this. We can't do this. And it, initially it was just like, wow, this is a big, big, you know, task. And they looked at us like we were crazy. And I'm like, look at it incrementally. And I mean, we would get one, maybe two every other week. And it was like, oh, Oh, it's not that bad. So once once we started doing it, they realized, oh, okay, the, the flow is not as bad as I thought it was going to be. At the beginning, yeah, you, you look at it and you're like, oh, my gosh, there's so much to do. But it's not. As long as you take it bit by bit, you're good. Great. That's really interesting to hear. Um, I know a lot of agencies deal with that, should we or shouldn't we answer. Um, so good to hear your perspective. Okay, another question. This is about private messages. And I don't know that we touched on this during this talk, but someone wants to know, do you receive, in addition to getting posts on your uh, page, do you receive private messages related to people's concerns? And what's your policy for responding to those? Do you archive those? Kind of how do you handle private messages? Actually, one of the examples that I gave was kind of a combination between private message and a, uh, a public message, which was the traffic. The initial message, the complaint, was actually on um, public forum. You know, they, we had posted something, they posted just below, and then and then we took that off, kind of offline, and we started private messaging that person. And so we do a combination of both. Um, we do answer every private message that comes through also, and we do archive that. And we ha actually, it's it's kind of crazy, but we, we, we're we adamant about answering private message because private message could be the place where you could receive a post record request or even a lawsuit behind some of the content that you're, you're giving them. Um, so 
yeah, it's really important that we do private message um, and we treat them just like if it was a public message. That's interesting. And I was I was talking to somebody from a police department recently. They were saying they're getting more and more tips over private message, which that is just wow, yet another yeah. kind of interesting facet to the situation. Um, okay, great. So another question. This is also related to your team. So you've got multiple people kind of working on your communications team, and how do you handle those different styles of moderation and wanting to interact? We have pretty much a standard the way we speak towards our audience. We always thank them for reaching out to us because we know that it's difficult to reach out to an agency and finding information. Then we acknowledge their feelings behind what they're supposed to, you know, what, what they're giving us the information. And then we get into the facts. And so um, tone is always professional, obviously, but um, we, we have that structure, so as long as people can stick to that structure, we're good. And, and yes, every, every division, for example, you know, our golf division is a little more witty and, um, you know, our fruit and spice is a little bit more technical. So they do have kind of like their personalities and their tones, and that's part of being different. So we, we kind of acknowledge that also. Okay, great. Uh, another question we've got is for Parks and Rec, what are some of the instances when you've had to use Archive Social besides, you know, public records requests? Wow. Um, I'm trying to think of, I don't have any specific examples where we've had a public records request but because we get so many. Um, I know that we've used several instances where we've had that, but um, we do use it for a public records request, and a lot of it comes through our central communications. So um, thank God for them. They kind of handle that. <laughs> That's great. Uh, and I know you use them kind of for searching and things like that as well, right? For example, oh, yeah. For creating yeah, yeah. Presentation. Like for uh, yeah, for okay, sentiment great. and figuring out things, yeah. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, so this question is, has there ever been a situation where someone was upset and you were not able to defuse the situation with your with your strategy of social listening? Yes, and it's, it's kind of been this ongoing um, person that's been kind of unhappy about the fact that, you know, we, we have a plan for a specific park and it's just, it's you know, it's going to take time for it. And they've, but you see the change in their tone. They get, went from like irate, confused, and just, you know, posting like crazy to kind of just like the slow drip. And so it's tolerable. Um, we've had a couple of those and we've taken them offline. And, and a lot of times when we do speak to them on the phone, they kind of just calm down. So we've had a couple of instances where people just don't give up. And then, you know, it's just because they want to be heard and they want the public to see it. Um, but they don't become kind of like a nuisance. They just kind of hang out and post every so often. They just tame tame themselves a little bit. But luckily, they don't incite anybody. So we're, we're good. That's good. So even if you can't fully put out the flame, you can at least kind of fan it down a little bit. Yes. <laughs> Well, great. This has been a great webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I learned a lot. I think everybody else did too. And everybody, you know, feel free to follow Yasini on Twitter, follow Anil on Twitter, and um, we'll send you out an email after this with a recording to the webinar. And if you have any comments, feel free to email them to us, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Yasini. Thank you. Bye. Bye.